Good evening. My name's Mike Grimshaw, um, and I'm presenting tonight on the what ifs, and my topic is what if rugby were our religion. What I want to talk about tonight is something that arises out of um, well over a decade of academic work and study, well over 40 years of doing sport, uh, well over 40 years of either playing, watching or reading and writing about rugby. My background is that I am a uh, trained in history, tra trained in church history, philosophy, theology. I be became a person who worked in religious studies and have also worked in New Zealand studies and now I find myself a sociologist. In other words, I can write and talk about whatever I like. <laughs> and part of that is actually rugby. Um, this talk uh, arises out of a series of uh, writings I've done for over a decade of, um, and the basis of this is what has become the first major work ever done on the question of rugby and religion in New Zealand, which got published last year in the International Journal of Religion and Sport. One of the things that always interested me is growing up in New Zealand, playing rugby, watching rugby, hearing the talk about rugby is why does no one actually write about it properly? Why does no one actually think about it? What does it mean? It's a bit like that, the oft-mentioned uh, discussion claim, rugby is New Zealand's religion. Why has no one who's ever worked in the study of religion in New Zealand ever actually got to grips with what does that mean? So I went, lo I went looking, and I went hunting for that. And part of this is looking at where does that term arise? Also, what could it actually mean and is it actually a problem? When we think about the role of sport in New Zealand, often we are told that sport or rugby has too big an influence. And yet if we consider the role of sport and other sports overseas, it makes our obsession, interest in rugby or in sport actually seem quite minimal. I've often said that the problem in New Zealand is not sport, it's actually the lack of alternatives. That's our real problem, that we don't give enough space to the other claims of culture. That's actually our real problem, and this is where I think we need to start. So this is where we start. So the question here that we have, uh, some people actually asked, who was this? Um, this? That actually shows my age that I actually know who that is. It's a, it's a very youthful Colin Meads. Uh, and this was the cover of a book that came out in about 1973, and I was always struck with the notion that there you have it's actually very similar to a lot of the iconographic pictures of Jesus holding the lamb. Uh, on the other side, here we have uh, a, a Nike poster with Lawrence D'Alio with um, ruck marks across his back. And here we have the noted rugby playing Mormon. Uh, I'm not sure if he's actually a practicing Mormon now. Ma'a Nonu with the, the crucifix, uh, the crucifixion tattooed upon his back. What I'm interested in is the way that rugby situates itself in New Zealand society, New Zealand culture, and what does that actually mean? But before we start, I think we've got to have some sort of framing uh, about how we might think about this. So Gregor Paul, the, this first quote, up, uh, first quote up here. Gregor Paul uh, is a Scotsman who has come across to New Zealand as a journalist, um, and he wrote a really interesting book called Black Obsession. And he said, rugby is often referred to as a religion in New Zealand, and in many ways it is. It's a form of worship at least, a means for young and old to gather to pay homage to a sport that pushes all their buttons. Then we've got Jamie Balich, uh, the, the premier New Zealand historian, who said, rugby, New Zealand Rugby Union ranks in socio-cultural resonance with soccer in Latin America and cockfights in Bali, New Zealand should be a world capital for the historical study of sport, but it is not. Almost as though, though sport is a religion too important for scholars to tamper with. Uh, I do acknowledge the, uh, the presence here of a scholar who does tamper with sport, Greg Ryan at the back, who has taught a lot of us to think about rugby in different ways, and soon will teach us to think about beer in different ways. It seems to be I don't know whether there's a transition here from the study of rugby to the study of beer, but Greg has gone that way. But Balich's quote is a really important one. And then Simon Cooper, who is a, a Dutch writer who's done a lot of writing about football, 
said, there are some subjects which are considered too sacred to write about, and there are also subjects which are thought too profane. Now, I think actually sport in New Zealand, and especially rugby, situates itself in that particular area. It's almost as if we can't think and write about it. In fact, if you're an academic in New Zealand, if you're a scholar, and you start talking about sport, and God help you if you start talking about rugby, you get pushed to the margins. It's not seen as a proper, sensible topic that you should deal with. And yet when we consider the history of this country, we consider the pervasive role that rugby plays, I wonder why that is the case. Is it because it's too sacred, it's set aside? Is it because it's too profane? Or is it that we're just really uncomfortable about dealing with these things? And that's what actually interests me. So I start off, and my thinking is influenced by this guy, Paul Tillich. And this is a, from a series of famous photographs where a photographer went to uh, famous Americans and asked them to jump. There's a great one also of um, Groucho Marx jumping. This is Paul Tillich jumping. I just like the idea of Paul Tillich jumping. But one of Tillich's uh, famous ways of thinking about religion and culture is to say religion is the substance of culture and culture is the form of religion. T.S. Eliot actually said something quite interesting along those lines as well. Where do you draw the lines between something that is considered religious and something that is cultural? Why do we want to draw those hard and fast lines? Who gets to decide where those lines are drawn? Why can't we think about things in cross-boundary ways? Why is religion always just constrained to the institution? Tillich makes us think about these things in new ways. And I want to think about and talk about the leakage that goes between religion and culture. If we think about, say, in Christchurch, the debate about the cathedral, is that a religious debate? Is it a cultural debate? Where do we draw the, the boundaries between those things? Is it actually both? So we need to think in new ways, rather than actually say, well, that's religion and that's culture, and those things actually don't never meet. So what I want to do is unpack some of those questions. If we go back to the start of thinking about and writing about rugby in New Zealand, one of the most important texts is uh, the complete rugby footballer on the New Zealand system. Okay, This is 1906. This is... Dave Gallagher and uh, Billy Steed's book. What they did was make a claim that something new was being done in New Zealand, in New Zealand rugby, and it was a game that was actually being done like a science. The science of rugby, which is about the frontier virtues of rugby in New Zealand. The claim that there was something done, that it was modern. We were doing something different in New Zealand that was a science. It was to be played and approached with a scientific mind. Yet when we consider rugby, the science of rugby primarily only occurs within the coaching of rugby. The playing of rugby, the watching, the supporting of rugby occurs in a different way. So we've always got this tension in New Zealand between the science of rugby and its mythologies, the way it's talked about in, from its origin as a science, and the way people actually experience it. Because as Gregor Paul notes, the culture in New Zealand is actually the antithesis of science. The way we experience it is actually quite different. It's actually as expression, it's actually as fun, as a means to show who you are, what you do, a commitment to play with style, the belief, the flair, the imagination. So we've always got this tension there sitting at the heart of our thinking about rugby. Is it a science? Is it a joy? There was a famous book written in America by Michael Novak called The Joy of Sports. I can't ever imagine a New Zealander ever actually writing a book called the joy of sports. It would actually be sacrilege to actually consider sports a joy, which is quite interesting. Could we actually ever write a book called The Joy of Rugby? 
Now, Novak was a noted academic. What's the difference between American culture and New Zealand culture that we find it very difficult to actually take seriously any claims that we might take sport seriously as joy, as a place of transcendence, as a place where meaning might actually be articulated and experienced in different ways. So we have to consider also the culture that we exist within. Why do we find it so difficult to think about rugby or sports in ways that the rest of the world actually finds quite easily to do? So that's something we have to think, sit there and hold underneath. Of course, a lot of this goes back to 1981. We have to remember the impact that the Springbok Tour in 81 actually had. And Greg McGee, noted playwright, author, junior All Black, in his memoirs said, many of the protesters, particularly the urban liberals and intelligentsia, also saw rugby as the enemy, as the embodiment of a value system they loathed, rural, misogynist, red-necked and national. It was difficult to have aspirations in the arts or indeed to have any pretension to an intellect and also be a rugby player and a fan. Now, a lot of that, in many ways, still seems to hold today. This is, um, this is Waikato in 81. I like the shot because, I mean, you've got the cross sitting there as well, that sort of... And that antithesis between religion and rugby was one thing that went, went on at this stage. 81, the scars of 81 sit just below the surface for a lot of people. Still, for a lot of families, they sit below the surface. They're up there with the, with the 51 waterside strike. I actually stopped playing club rugby in 1981. I was 14. I'd played for South Canterbury the years before. And I stopped playing club rugby in, in small town Geraldine. I went and played soccer on Saturdays, but still played rugby for the school. I couldn't actually completely go over to the dark side. <laughs> but I never went back. But those scars sit within many families still. They sit within the study of sport. They sit primarily also very strongly in humanities and social science departments across the country in New Zealand within academics. In many ways, to be an academic in New Zealand is well, the line was drawn in 1981 or in reference to 1981 and rugby was put on the other side. Now, in many ways, deservedly. But not all people who play or support or like or enjoy rugby actually were on that other side. There were many complex engagements that went on. Graham Murray wrote very interestingly about that. David Kirk wrote very interestingly about that. And many people after that time have come to reimagine it in a different way or think about it in a different way, but we don't even talk very much about 81. And that division, in many ways, the closest we've come to almost a civil war in this country in the 20th century has been written out of our understandings. And I think part of what we've got to do if we're going to talk about rugby is go back and revisit 81 in a way that we properly understand. But none of what we can talk about is, can be done unless we actually remember the ongoing scars of 81. Now, I'm probably the last generation who actually have those scars as part of me. So anyone who's sort of under 40, you just don't know what actually happened. Yep. The Springbok Tour. It divided the country divided the country incredibly in 1981. Were you not here in 81? Did you not see the, the, the protests? Yeah. Out on the streets, the Red Squad. I mean, I've got a friend who plays rugby. He was on, he was protesting. He was protesting. His father was running one of the Red Squads. That's the sort of divisions that actually carried on. My friend continued to play rugby, ended up being a foundation member, God help him, of the Melbourne Rebels. <laughs> but those divisions are still just below the surface in many families. 
and many discussions about the role of rugby. And I think we've got to hold that there. That was a tension. Unless we take that seriously, we're not going to understand the problems about talking about rugby in New Zealand. Now, I don't mean to be a downer on that, but I think that's something we actually got to hold there as part of the, the questions. So where does, it come, where does the debate come from? Well, in many ways, it's always been traced back to this guy, John Mulgan, the great New Zealand myth mythological figure in many ways. Rugby player, Rhodes Scholar, war hero, went off to Oxford, worked for Oxford University Press, got military cross for his work with the partisans in Greece, goes to Cairo, kills himself at the end of the war. The great hero of New Zealand letters, sort of the man of action. And in this book, Report on Experience, which has just been republished because there's a whole sort of been a whole revival of Mulgan. Mulgan creates a series of claims which have become part of the mythology about the role of rugby in New Zealand. What does a new country turn to to create its identity? Famously, this is the this is the famous sort of mythological quote that turns up everywhere. Rugby football was the best of our pleasures. It was religion and desire and fulfillment all in one. Now, any book about New Zealand sport, New Zealand culture, tends to grab hold of John Mulgan's quote. Uh, Sporo Zavos has used it many times. So has Ron Polensky in a lot of works. It's, it's one of the great quotes that is out there. Why has it been used? Well, one of the interesting things is when I actually went and um, asked Spyro Zavos, who now, um, people, have, have you heard of Spyro Zavos? Yeah. I mean, now runs the Raw, the raw over in Sydney. Um, really interesting online uh, magazine, basically, about sport. And I said to him, well, why, why do you think you've used it so many times? And he, he uh, in an e email, he said to me, I'm fond of the Mulgan quote, because it seems to be so New Zealand in its orientation and so generous in the way Michael King was in the last paragraph of his history to the essential and prevailing New Zealand character. A lot of sports academics, in my view, have a Marxist view of the necessary class struggle of, as the dynamics of most societies and are inaccurate and unkind to the New Zealand character and achievements. Talking to Spyro, he found rugby as something that enabled him to become a New Zealander as an immigrant Catholic boy in the 1930s. So for him, this becomes an entry point. One of the interesting things is how people have used rugby or talked about rugby as part of the way to frame a New Zealand identity as an entry point. So what we've got here is something, this claim of rugby as religion, well, a lot of people who work in this area or reference this area only go back to this, 1947, as the origin of the claim that rugby is New Zealand's religion. But when you actually go hunting around, you find it goes further back than that. But what also does... Mulgan say, well in this report he also says, our broad pursuits, this is of the interwar generation, were only cultural in the broader sense. They were horse racing, playing rugby football, and beer drinking, especially playing rugby football. Now again, as Greg has often demonstrated, this is a bit of a myth about the pervasiveness of rugby. But what I'm interested in is actually the pervasiveness of the myths the way that the myths circulate and claim something about New Zealand life. And, I mean, here is, this was actually an album of rugby racing and beer songs from the early 1960s that you could actually, <laughs> and, and, and for some of them, I mean, you'll recognise, I mean, the infamous six o'clock swill. But what I'm interested in is the way that, I mean, this is, in a sense, that old holy trinity of New Zealand cultural or masculine identity, the rugby racing and beer. And what's also interesting when you trace back is actually the conflicting, and I'm going to talk about this, the conflicting claims and influence of rugby compared to racing 
as that which provides a form of religion in New Zealand. And it's really only from probably the 1950s that rugby really starts to take over as the national religion in comparison to racing. Now, a lot of that's got to do with the 56 Springbok Tour as sort of the infamous crusade through New Zealand and could we actually beat the box. But really up to the 1950s, there was an ongoing tension between racing and rugby as to what was really the religion of New Zealand in many ways. And the turn to rugby has a lot to do with claims of morals. And that's something that's really interesting as well. The morality of rugby was part compared to racing, and I'll talk about that later. But this is one of the letters uh, of John Mulgan to his parents. In 1941, he is in uh, Northern Ireland, and he keeps on writing back to his parents. So the letters of John Mulgan have been published quite recently. They're quite interesting. He said, only one or two things in my life ever seem so important to me as some games of football that I played when I was at school. That's not a rational judgment. I know other things have been more important, but it's a true statement of what my emotions recorded. Now, what's interesting about this is, again, he knows it's not rational. So Gallico instead's claim that rugby is to be approached as a science, well, if in a scientific framework, you'd say, well, it's not rational, therefore it doesn't count. What Mulgan's saying is that there is something emotive, something almost mythological about the hold of rugby upon New Zealand. Now, it's no different to Wales. Wales have actually gone one step further. There's an interesting book called Canlon, which has just come out. There's a poet, a writer, who actually got appointed as the artist in residence to the Welsh Rugby Union <laughs> and wrote a book. It's just that. And if you want it, it's in the public libraries around. Very interesting book in sort of a sense it goes through a particular game but expands out into the history. Now that's, I could, I'd like to see the New Zealand Rugby Football Union actually appoint an artist in residence. Now that sort of integration of culture and sport is something that we need to actually work on. It's something more that, in the line of what the Europeans do with religion and sport or culture and sport or the Americans. So we still have this particular divide but the myths overcome sort of the structured realities. And then again, he writes to his father, I think that young men need not a state religion, this is 1943, but a society that promises recognition to work or enthusiasm in whatever form it takes. And the reason is because outside of previously rugby and more latterly war, he finds this sort of meaning in war, he says, there seemed no faith or purpose in anything we did. Now, again, the mythology of rugby, the claim that rugby is a religion, comes back to this question, well, where else do you put your faith? Where else do you find purpose? Now, it's not just rugby that has this, but the claim that rugby is a place where people find meaning and purpose, either playing or supporting, raises interesting questions about the wider conditions of New Zealand society. And what interests me in all of this is, again, not that sport is too dominant, but where are the alternatives? Why are we so unprepared to give value to the other, other forms of culture out there? Where is our support for the arts? I mean, think about the great debate in Christchurch about building a stadium. How many people are actually going to turn up to there? I'm a season ticket holder for the Crusaders. I've really been at a stadium, even the 17,000 stadium, that has actually been full. We're going to build a 35,000 person stadium? How full is it actually going to be? Why don't we have actually have spaces for the arts? Why aren't we trying to get the art gallery open quicker? Now, there's no reason why you can't like sport and the arts. In fact, I think you should to be well-rounded. But we tend to divide these things off. Now, this is what Mulgan's talking about as part of the history of this country. Of course, Morgan is best known for what 
some will still claim is the great New Zealand novel, that mythical beast in itself. So in 1939, John Morgan writes Man Alone, which becomes almost the claim of New Zealand identity, masculinity, and nationhood, about the man who goes off, the immigrant. We forget he's actually an immigrant who comes to New Zealand, the main character of Man Alone, travels around the countryside, ends up in having an encounter with the Maori wife of the, the farmer he works for, kills him, goes off into the country, and then flees and goes back to London and ends up in Spain. It's one of sort of a, a narrative of New Zealand in the 20s and the 1930s. Very little actual discussion in the novel about rugby, apart from towards the start where Johnson is the main character. He says, it was not long before Johnson was at home in this country, New Zealand. He talked as they all talked. He got to know the dates of the race meetings and where to get beer in town at most times. And the story of the 1905 match when Wales beat the All Blacks by one try to nil, and why it was necessary to have a farmer's government to protect the real interests of the country. <laughs> now, the echoes of what Greg McGee was talking about can be found back here. The linking of rugby into such a particular version of New Zealand. You've got racing, beer, rugby, and rural conservatism. Now what's interesting is we also have that myth of rugby pride, tied primarily into rural districts. But again, as I defer to Greg, I mean Greg has shown that I mean, most All Blacks and most rugby players actually didn't come from the country, they actually came from the towns. So we have these conflicting mythologies again that exist within our understanding of the country. Part of what I want to say is that unless we understand rugby properly, we can't understand this country or the society. You don't have to like rugby, but you should understand it. Because without understanding it, you're not going to understand the country you live in. Now, the dry run for, in many ways for what um, Mulgan expressed were actually done by his father. This is Alan Mulgan, who was one of the noted men of letters, famously wrote a book called Home in the 1930s about his trip back to England even though he was of Northern Irish descent and was born in Katakati. <laughs> he, uh, Morgan was a good, able journalist, quite an able poet, not a very good novelist, but his, his one novel, Spur of Morning, is in a sense the history, an alternative history of New Zealand in the early 20th century. John Mulgan actually did a lot of editing work, tried to get it placed, and finally did at a publisher in London. Spur of Morning is a, you can still find it, we've got copies up in the university library if anyone actually wants to go and read it. It's actually worth reading. It's a really interesting story about New Zealand between two characters, one who's a rugby player and becomes an MP, a left-wing MP, not a right-wing MP, and another one who is actually a cricketer. Uh, there's particular claims and there's various stories about New Zealand all that flow through that. But central to this is the claim of rugby that provides a binding together, an overcoming of division in the new colony. So here on page 12 of Spirit of Morning, the, the purple prose, this is a great book for purple prose really, that goes right through. So here, this is the religion of rugby. The religion was the stronger because it caught its devotees young. The game knew no class. Navvies played alongside lawyers and young Anglican clergy on the wing gladly accepted passes from centres who professed the most fancy religion or none at all. The great heart of the people was touched by rugby alone. What's interesting about this is that Mulgan saw himself not as sitting on the edges of society, but someone who was representing the society back to itself. So part of what Mulgan is doing here is saying, how do we consider the role of rugby? What did it actually do? Well, the mythology is that it overcomes class, that it overcomes those things that divide during the rest of the week. A moment of 80-minute sort of transcendence of division. So whether it's class, 
whether it is religion, whether it's politics. Of course, there's no discussion about ethnicity at this time. But here is rugby that seeks to unite a society that is still divided during the rest of the week. Okay? Is that a reality? Well, yes and no. But the mythologies that sit there are actually quite interesting. Now, this actually has an impact, I would believe, on what John Morgan writes. So we, get, we start going back. So this is the religion of rugby earlier than 1947. So how do we think about religion? Well, what do I mean by it? Well, religion comes from a couple of uh, ways of thinking. And those of us who work in religion actually know there is no singular definition of what religion is. I'm about to go to, at the end of the year, to the American Academy of Religion, the premier sort of conference in this area. There will be, I think, there's somewhere between 7,000 and 8,000 people attending. There's well over 150 different sections to present on. Nobody there actually agrees about what religion is. And nobody ever has actually agreed about what religion is. But perhaps the one thing that people can do is actually trace it back to where it comes from. And one of them is actually uh, religare, to bind together. One of the origins of religion is that which binds together. So if we think about religion as that which binds together, we also have to remember, so here we've got the Crusaders binding together. There's a whole lot of interesting things about sort of deconstructing the claim of the Crusader, especially when there was a Californian football team called Jihad that wasn't allowed to play just after 9-11. But that which binds together also separates off. So here are pro and anti-tour supporters and protesters battling on the streets of Hamilton. The religion of rugby, well, it binds some people together, also divides off. All religions do that. So we have to think about if rugby is a religion, it's a religion as well as binding, it divides. Here again is some more people prose from Alan Mulgan. The murmur, this is a game, the murmur swelled into a roar as the teams filed out the great moment had come. The moment that was for thousands an event transcending all their common tasks. At once an epitome of the battle of life and an escape from it. Primitive urges surged up. Unsatisfied longings for romance and poetry stirred up in the hearts of men and women who would have laughed scornfully if they had been told that they harboured any such aspirations. Blood flowed more quickly and more generously. And that's within the crowd, not on the field. Chivalry contested with passionate loyalties for the conscience of the onlooker. Terrible purple prose. But the mythology that is sitting there underneath about the claim, about what rugby is doing. Mulgan is a reporter as well. What he's trying to do in this is report what he believes he has felt and seen and experienced in New Zealand in the early 20th century. That's how we have to read it. Not just as bad purple prose, but as an attempt to express what was actually being felt at that time. The role that rugby was, in a sense, filling for many people in this society. Of course, here we go, Donald Cowie, who wrote a book called New Zealand From Within in 1937, said rugby is a second religion in New Zealand. The first religion is actually racing. The oldest and most popular sports is the national religion. So there's a lot of contestation at this time about what is actually the oldest. And Cowie says, well, actually, well, if you think about it, there are more people who get involved in racing than are members of the Church of England. More people get involved, he says, in rugby and racing than are actually involved in the practice of religion. More people attend weekly rugby and racing than actually turn up on a Sunday. Even if we think today, in New Zealand, say, 12% at the most attend a service regularly, which is once a month. Okay, so that's what... Um, 
just on 400,000, just over 400,000, which is probably Ashburton to Rangiora. Once a month in New Zealand, Ashburton and Rangiora attend a church service. Nobody else does. When we think about how many people, say, attend rugby or watch rugby on the week, there's a different binding together, different claims. So New Zealand also doesn't have a state religion, never has. It's never been an officially Christian country. It's never had an official state religion. Probably the closest we've actually had is religion, rugby. This is, um, this is Pyra in the early 20th century race course. Laumann in 1908 says rugby is the religion. Our early race courses, he said, were lean to chapels and our contemporary race courses are completed Gothic cathedrals. That's 1908 in New Zealand. So the claim about the role, the alternative ways of thinking about religion, we've got to remember that in the early 20th century, religion was seen in, by many people a progressive understanding to be on the decline. It was going to fade away. What takes the place is often seen as sport. Sport in different ways. Now, central to the difference to rugby is going to be that of professionalism and commerce. And the difference that rugby has against racing is that it is amateur. And there was, there was some gambling, but little gambling that actually occurred there. And this is also part of the division that goes on between Rugby and rugby, rugby league. Where do you sit on the issue of money and morality? Here we got William Pember Reeves, the great Fabian socialist. Notes, football is quite as popular as horse racing, this is 1908 again, indeed among boys and lads more popular, and whatever may be its future, football has up to the present time been a clean, honest, genuine game free from professionalism and excessive gambling. So part of the role that rugby played in New Zealand was as moral virtue. And in many ways, not so much even against the churches, but against the more pervasive claims of horse racing. It's the religion of morality and virtue against gambling and professionalism. So the claim of rugby is actually has to be situated as much against racing as it does against institutional Christianity in this country. So we have to think about where rugby sits in New Zealand society in different ways as well. So this is actually where it all starts. 1908. The Anglo-Welsh football team came to New Zealand. They came to New Zealand in a sense to try and stop a leakage by New Zealand players after 1905, across to Rugby League. Wasn't a, well, wasn't a Lions to it, but it was the closest thing they could rustle up at the time. And the way, the reason it came was to try and restore rugby against the encroachment of league. Now, there's a fantastic book that was written, in one of the great tour books of the 1908 tour. And I mean, the Anglo-Welsh just seemed to sort of party their way around the country in a way that made Kip Fawcett's infamous statement about touring South Africa in 76 seem nothing. I don't know if anyone knows how many people know Kip Fawcett. He said he, said he hoped he would score more off the field than on. <laughs> now, the, the, the stories that come out of there, I mean, there are various sort of activities that occurred over in Greymouth and they had to sort of basically almost call in the police. Uh, Players getting off trains, meeting women on trains and going off into their house over the weekend and coming back again. When the boats were leaving, a number of women flocking to the wharves in Auckland and one player leaned over and fell in, trying to kiss the woman as he left and fell into the water. I mean, I mean there's nothing new that actually happens there. But what's interesting in the book that was written about the tour, the manager, George Harnett, is reported as saying, rugby is your religion or should I say, one of your chief religions. This is the, 
This is the origin of the claim that rugby is our religion. And it's an outsider. It's an outsider claim. It's not a claim that arises out of New Zealand. It's someone coming to New Zealand, traveling around, looking at the country, looking at the new colony, the new country, and saying, actually, what is actually happening here? And R.A. Barr, who also wrote, covered the tour, actually made something interesting here as well. He said, in describing the game versus the Maori in Rotorua, he says that for Maori, rugby is their religion just as much as it is to the Pākehā in New Zealand. So it's not just a, a Pākehā religion, it was also seen and experienced as a Maori religion right from 1908. Which makes us reconsider the role of rugby in New Zealand's history and culture and society in a different way. Why did it exist in such a way? Why has it been written out of so much of our history? Why haven't we considered what it actually does? Now, this is um, the British captain, Arthur Harding. The difference of New Zealand rugby religion is it's as a religion and a business in New Zealand, this is 1908 as they saw it, compared to a pastime and a pleasure. This is, in a sense, between science and the amateur. So we took rugby almost too seriously. We played it too seriously and we took it too seriously and in many ways we supported it too seriously compared to how the English and the Welsh felt it should be supported. Even the Welsh felt it was too much of a religion here. So Harding says that it practically seems to be, seems to be practically a religion to a level that even the Welsh cannot compare. Now, why is that? This is one of the questions I want to keep on thinking about. Why does religion, why does rugby take the central role of devotion, fanaticism, centrality? Is it because of the lack of alternatives? Where do we turn to if we don't turn to sport? That's the central question that New Zealand society has to keep on asking. It's not that sport is actually m more important here than elsewhere. It's just that the alternatives are deemed less important than elsewhere, which makes us a, a rather narrow society. That's the central issue for New Zealand. Not that rugby is a religion, but we lack the importance of the alternatives. The problem is not rugby. The problem is our lack of interest and concern and support for the alternatives of culture. Leo Fanning wrote a book, Players and Slayers 1910, and this is the question, is it a masculine religion? Where do men go? Religion has tended to be primarily feminine for the last 150 years. It's something that women do, primarily. It's run by men for women. <laughs> of course, say so there needs to be some deconstruction that goes on there about what's actually happening in religion. But Fanning says, if the pulpits would only furnish rugby football metaphors and similes, the old question, this is 1908, the old question, why don't men go to church would have a sudden death. Why should not the preacher say, brethren, take your blessings cleanly on the full, don't fumble them, do not dribble with ideas, kick high and follow up. Also remember that life is a scrimmage by which the ball is not always hooked by the front ranker. <laughs> I've got a feeling that Bob Lowe read that. Uh, those of you who remember Bob Lowe, Bob Lowe actually wrote a book about rugby in New Zealand as religion and for Christianity, and wrote a actually wrote some a series of prayers about Lancaster Park and cricket and football that you can still find it in second-hand book sales. But that is the question. Does, is rugby actually a masculine religion, or was it for many ways the masculine religion for New Zealand? Did it fill the void that religion for women filled? Community, identity, mythologies, participation, a breakout of everyday life, a set of expectations and rules to live by hopes, 
The other way of thinking about religion is relegere, to reread. What religions do is they give you a way to reread life and its experiences, alternatives. So, I mean, here are three, three books that were written. This is um, Gordon Slatter's The Pagan Game. I don't know if anyone's actually ever read The Pagan Game. Uh, he also wrote a famous, infamous book called With a Gun in My Hand, which is uh, a very interesting book about uh, a returned serviceman after the war traveling around Christchurch during a rugby uh, Ranfurly Shield match. Gordon Slatter was uh, a teacher at Christchurch Boys High. A pagan game is set in a North Island school around, a, around leading up to a big game, and the pagan game is the description that uh, one of the characters' wives describes rugby. It's actually a pagan game. It's the pagan religion of New Zealand. And I think in many ways he's actually right. The pagan is, is tied to the ground, tied to the earth, tied to the field. Now, some of you might remember in 2007 there was actually a campaign before New Zealand went off and failed to do anything proper at the 2007 Rugby World Cup called Of This Earth, where they actually went around and they dug up bits of field from around the country where the various uh, rugby footballers had actually come from. And they took all this earth and they sieved it down, they put it in these great big urns and took it across to France as inspirational holy earth. <laughs> when we lost, uh, when we failed to progress, uh, this all disappeared. Uh, I've tracked it down, the, the rugby, uh, rugby museum, Palmerston North has one, they just hide it over the side. And um, Andy Blood, who uh, of Wybans at that stage, the advertising agency, they've got one sitting in the advertising agency, but... Um, the whole notion of holy earth, the sacred field, as a pagan game, a game of demigods, a game of a, a, a movable pantheon of the gods sits there as part of, um, I think New Zealand is still a very pagan country. Landscape paganism, as one of my students, Jason Stanley, once described New Zealand religion. We sort of see inspiration in a whole lot of things outside of traditional religion. Uh, Howard Joseph. All Black, local lawyer, wrote a very interesting novel called Game Without End, which is a social history of Christchurch, and also is tied in with a big discussion of rugby and Catholicism. It's well worth a read. It gives you a different understanding of the history of Christchurch, but religion's at central to this. And then there's Morris G, the great New Zealand novelist. People forget that his first novel in the 1950s, and I'm not quite sure why they've actually got more contemporary figures on the cover there when they reissued it, was um, the big season. And the big season is the rugby season. And I'll talk about this very soon, but Morris G actually uses rugby to talk about New Zealand society. This is um, something that's sitting there in the Macmillan Brown, which is also interesting, the book. There was a claim about a mythological sort of almost the Bible of New Zealand, that when New Zealand soldiers overseas would get together with the South Africans and Australians, they'd come and sort of quote from the book. There is actually copies of the book which exist, and one's in the Macmillan Brown, and it's actually illustrated by Peter McIntyre. Of course, Peter McIntyre doesn't mention this in his biography, in his autobiography. But it's sitting there, and this is where they're sitting there, they're reading from the book as sort of as the Bible, and it... Um, well, it says, Lo, the teams moved on the, field, on the face of the field, and there were Kiwis crying in the scrum, Suffer, little springboks, and come unto us, and we shall teach you the laws of the book. And the concluding statement of the book is, In the beginning was the book, and the book was with NZ, and behold, it was good. <laughs> and this is, again, part of the mythology that rugby operates as religion. Morris G., in the big season, has a character where he says, This is what, how we see New Zealand. Bob, Bob Scott kicked a goal in Auckland. The favourite was scratched in Wellington. The beer ran out in Christchurch. Christ was crucified in Dunedin. Get those graded in order of importance, and I know what will come last every time. So again, this notion of the holy trinity of New Zealand life, or masculine New Zealand life, rugby, racing, and beer. And there's um, the infamous, the famous Bob Scott, both with boots on and boots off, for those who know he was famous for being able to kick a a football from over the goalpost from just over halfway with bare feet. But G's question there about what's important, 
again needs to be taken seriously. This is a literary work. This is G expressing how New Zealand is experienced. So how do we think about this? Well, I actually like to go to this guy, Fred Exley. Wrote a famous sort of alcoholic novelist. One, he only really wrote one great work uh, called A Fan's Notes, which is all basically about sport, drinking, madness, and sex, in that sort of order. But it's one of the great American novels. Fred Exley, writing about the New York Giants, says, The Giants were my delight, my folly, my anodyne, my intellectual stimulation, an island of directness in a world of circumspection, a life-giving and exalting force. Americans are quite happy to write about sport in this way. American poets, American writers are quite happy to talk about sport in this way. I always wonder why we're not. That divide, being an intellectual, being a writer, being an artist in America, means that you, you are not divided off from sport. What I really like about this is the way in which he talks about what does sport do. It's an, it can be exalting. It can be experienced as life-giving. An island of directness. So what happens if rugby is the claim of an alternative as a religion? Religion in many ways is the claim of an alternative. What happens if rugby exists as that way? In many ways, it exists against a very rational enlightenment modernity. It enables claims to be made of experience and how to participate in myth and history, transcendence, rituals, emotion, communal identity, and a Manichaean dualism, a battle between light and dark, good and evil, that in rational modernity makes little sense. If you look at sport rationally, it makes no sense whatsoever. That's what makes it so interesting. It makes no sense, and yet it has such an impact. In many ways, therefore, it's anti-modern. It's the alternative place to experience modernity. It's romanticism. It's very romanticist in a materialistic and nihilistic society. A society that says, well, what are we on about? The sports person can say, actually, we're on about this. What can I feel? Feel this. Where are the myths? Here are the myths. Where's the meaning? Where's the transcendence? Where's the hope and despair? And I mean, if we think we have this. Consider Melbourne and AFL week. I mean, an AFL grand final week means nothing it uh, means New Zealand rugby means nothing in comparison to that. What does it do? It holds that whole city in anticipation and hope and myth and narrative. Arthur Vers Louise says, well, anti-modernism is fundamental to the creative impulse of modernity. What happens if sport is where creativity actually occurs? And modern industrial society calls forth anti-modernism in the creative individual. What I'm interested in is the way in which New Zealand creative individuals have tried to avoid sport compared to elsewhere. Think about American literature. Think about European literature, culture, society, Asian culture and society. Sport is central to it. New Zealand just doesn't get it in many ways. So if we think about this, relegare to bind together, relegare to reread. Perhaps it actually exists as the para, the alongside. It's not that sport is the New Zealand religion, but it's a very important member of the New Zealand religions. It exists alongside or beyond the traditional understandings. So perhaps we need to go, and I just love this photo anyway for what it says about French intellectuals. I mean, this is Roland Barthes, I mean, sitting there and he's got the bottle of probably wine sitting over there, cigarette in his mouth, staring off into the distance. And he wrote a very fascinating book called What is Sport? I'd like to see some of our philosophers in New Zealand actually write a book, What is Sport? I think I'll be waiting a long time, but it'd be nice to see them do that. He says it's global mythology. Sport is made in order to speak the human contract. It's where we see fleeting moments of style and perfection. The players as intermediaries of transcendence. It's where we see 
fallible, imperfect human beings do what we consider to actually be the impossible. They shouldn't be able to do that. Think about Michael Jordan and hang time. Think about the sidestep. Think about the goal, the shot. These are, in many ways, incredibly fallible human beings. Think about Tiger Woods. Nasty, horrible piece of work as a human being, but able of moments of sublime transcendence and perfection on the golf course. Sport, he says, is a competition, not a conflict. We conquer not each other, but the resistance of things. We overcome the resistance of things in sport. We make things happen. And he says it liberates. It consumes certain joys, conflicts, and agonies without letting anything be destroyed. We experience life's fatal combat, but it's distanced by the spectacle. It's cleared of its effects, it shames, it loses the noxiousness, but we lose nothing of the brilliance or its meaning in that fleeting transcendence of sport. And for New Zealand, it tends to be within rugby. Now, if we think we take it seriously, this is a chapel in the south of France. <laughs> this is a working church. This is a working Catholic church in the south of France. Here we've got Mary and Jesus throwing the ball into the line out. <laughs> Here we've got the scrum and Jesus is the halfback presenting the ball to Mary. That really is the religion of rugby. I'd like to see a Catholic church in this country actually put a stained glass window up like that. <laughs> I'd like to see an Anglican church do it. That is when actually religion and rugby actually come together. What we get is this thing like this. I mean, we get this commodified. This is, this is sort of Dan Carter as sort of the shaman, as the, as the tanifar almost. But Rogan Taylor, who did a lot of work on British football, talks about the shaman, the talismanic force at the centre of a team. In rugby, I mean, at the moment, it's someone like Dan Carter or it's someone like Richie McCaw. It used to be someone like Shane Warne for Australian sport. I mean, there's a fantastic book by Gideon Haig called On Warne, which uh, is probably one of the best sports books I've ever read. I'd like to see someone write something like that on rugby in New Zealand. But again, if you get a chance, go and read On Warne by Gideon Haig. But this notion of the talismanic force at the center of a team who makes things happen, who in a sense can almost change time and space, make, make a game speed up or slow down. Dan Carter actually does that. If you watch him play, on his day, he makes things happen in ways that you don't actually expect it to. That's the talismanic force. But Really, sport is a stage where one performs separate from the frustrations and limitations of everyday life. It's the everyday experience of transcendent and alternative reality. I am no Pentecostalist by any means, but the closest I've ever come to speaking in tongues is on the, is on the terraces of, of watching the rugby. My moments of greatest transcendence, of everyday transcendence, probably occur when I'm standing there shouting away. I don't know why I do it, but I jump up. And I see her look around. I mean, the other week I found myself sitting next to an old friend of mine who is the respiratory specialist for the South Island. And both of us are standing there yelling at the ground, yelling at the ref when Glenn Jackson awarded the Waratahs that final kick, which thankfully Beric Barnes failed. We are meant to be rational, intelligent, educated human beings, and there we are, yelling like primitive idiots. Sport does that to you. It even does it when I'm sitting watching it on TV. I become superstitious watching the cricket. I cannot move. If I move, perhaps I can't go and get a cup of tea because if I do that, we, there might be a wicket. I know it's irrational. But... What does sport do in that way that actually, it actually brings us there? It is that sort of claim of transcendence alternative reality. So it becomes everyday myths of locality, the global and the local. Bonnie miller Elsmore wrote a really interesting essay about US football as religion. She said, if mainline institutional religion no longer holds sway amongst the dominant culture, is it what does? What has replaced it? What does draw attention fascination, and in the long run, 
pious devotion. Sport, in many ways, has taken over from institutional religion or runs alongside in its devotion to institutional religion for many people. I mean, here are the, the souvenirs that you now get, the holy relics. <laughs> so what type of religion? Well, I think it's a New Zealand religion of the seculum, of the secular, that which binds us together. It's a para-religion. It runs alongside institutional religions. It's a religare. It binds us together and divides us. But it's also a religere that enables us to reread ourselves and each other's, and most importantly, allows us to participate in myth and to transcend the mundane. So this is um, a New Zealand Maori um, poster put out by Adidas. Here you've got the land anthropomorphized. Here you've got Maoridom, Tangata, Whenua. Here you've got the mythological history and here you have the contemporary Maori rugby team. That actually says something about New Zealand in ways that we should actually take seriously. It's not just corporate advertising. Because you could actually, and they have, they've put rugby up here as well. They've put the All Blacks up here. What is, why don't we take rugby seriously? What are we so afraid about in taking rugby seriously? That's what really interests me. Why are we so afraid of taking rugby, of taking sports seriously in this country? In many ways, rugby is a necessary myth. Daniel Dubasson, one of the great a contemporary thinkers on mythology says, myths do not precede religion. They are rather central contemporary embodiments and expressions of what we wish religion to be and to value. The religion of rugby is actually central to that mythology. It tells us something about what this country believes it should be and should value. You don't have to like the religion. You can be a heretic. You can be a dissenter. But we've got to take it seriously. My concern is that a country that has such a central myth in religion wants to believe that it doesn't exist. And that tells us something very interesting about ourselves and about ourselves as a society. Thank you very much.